Thanks for coming to this talk, uh, which is about Apache Cotton. Um, and my name is Ian Shu. I'm a Mesos developer at Twitter, and uh, Apache Cotton is this framework that we've been developing to run MySQL on top of Mesos. All right, I guess it's a good time to, to start. Uh, so before I start, I kind of wanted to, to ask the audience, um, how many of you have to deal with MySQL either as a user or as an operator in your work? So are they managed in a highly automated fashion? All right, so, so for the hand of you uh, who raised your hands, uh, I think uh, maybe it's worth uh, for us to, to chat about uh, what it's like for, for you guys to, to automate uh, the management of, um, of MySQL. Um, and for the rest of you, I think this is something that you could uh, introduce to your organization as something uh, that can help uh, the life of the users and the life of the, the, the DBAs. Um, so let me just uh, start by giving you a short history of uh, Cotton up to this point. Um, so as you may know, uh, I'm from Twitter, and, and Mesos is the, the cornerstone of Twitter's compute platform. We basically, on top of Mesos and Aurora, we run most of our services. Um, and MySQL is the backbone of uh, Twitter's data platform, even with the growing importance of uh, NoSQL databases, MySQL remains uh, one of the most important data stores at Twitter. So uh, what happened was during the hack week, uh, a bunch of us on the Mesos team at Twitter thought, mm, uh, maybe we, should, we could do something about the situation. And uh, we just uh, created a prototype called uh, Mesos. I think it's pretty easy to see how the name, uh, where the name came from. Um, and to, to, to prove that MySQL actually works on Mesos. Uh, so it actually, we proved that it worked and uh, we won a, a word out of it. So it was pretty encouraging. And then we started uh, uh, put more effort into developing it as a product and then moved open source it and moved this uh, development into Apache Incubator and named it Apache Cotton. And, and why the name? Uh, I think, uh, at least to me, I think it's pretty obvious because uh, cotton and cloud, there are some pretty interesting characteristics that's pretty similar between the two. Um, and it's definitely not inspired by uh, Calico. So uh, with this talk, I hope to draw more interest from the community to, to the project. So um, why do we do uh, MySQL on Mesos? I, I just uh, uh, did a simple poll that uh, I, th I think within many organizations, certainly including Twitter, that um, DBAs run MySQL clusters, databases. Uh, they leverage scripts. They leverage um, other tooling such as Puppet. But still, it's more or less of a, many, many tasks are still remaining uh, like a manual thing. Um, and it, it's just uh, so for a user to launch a new Mesos cluster, uh, a MySQL cluster, basically where you, what, what you do is you go to uh, the Jira uh, uh, project and file tickets and meet, meet with people and to wait for them to get started on them. So I don't think that should be the way. And uh, we should transition into a automated and self-service uh, way for people to launch MySQL. If they can do that for other services, why cannot they also do that for MySQL? And just to quote, uh, this from uh, this morning's keynote by Epanage, uh, distributed, uh, distributed systems should manage themselves. Um, so that's also uh, the book uh, that Epanage quoted. Uh, so, so I think well, one thing you can summarize uh, the Cotton Project by is what if we read this book, thick book for you, and put that into Cotton and on top of Mesos? and it's all taken care of for you. Uh, so that's all good. Mesos definitely is the way 
uh, we should go. But why Cotton? Why a separate framework? Why not use generic schedulers such as Aurora and, uh, for example, a, a Marathon? I think uh, it, it basically comes down to uh, either you want to use a lot of things that's already in these schedulers or you want the flexibility of um, doing more interesting things, which I'll explain below. Um, so these generic schedulers uh, up to this point mostly are geared towards stateless uh, tier one services where you launch uh, a couple of replicas or instances of, of your uh, job which are pretty much more or less identical. And uh, when they die, they're like the herd. When they die, you just you know, compensate that by, it's pretty straightforward for the scheduler to know what to do next. So you can launch a few more instances to compensate for that. Uh, but MySQL uh, is kind of this big heavy piece of software. It's got a lot of knobs for you to tune and it's, it's stateful. Um, and the other argument and, and one thing we found we need the flexibility for is that uh, with MySQL you cannot just be like we launch this thing and just forget about it and, and, and have, have these predefined uh, uh, ways to handle their failover, their um, their crash and, and, and all that. So Cotton actually coordinates uh, these MySQL instances after they've been launched. So I think that's one of the main reasons uh, that we decided to, to write another framework. Um, so this is a typical Mesos cluster where you have uh, a bunch of applications, distributed applications running on the left side and, and they launch stuff onto uh, these uh, boxes on the right side which are Mesos agents. Um, I think for all the, all of the attendees of MesosCon, I don't have to uh, preach to the choir again about why use Mesos. You, you get these better utilization across the cluster. You can see all the share uh, uh, the hosts to drive utilization up uh, without sacrificing performance by uh, performance uh, isolation and all that good stuff. So Cotton is written this way. Uh, you have the scheduler as part of the application and you have the executor which is deployed on side of the tests. And uh, one thing interesting to notice, if you happen to have these generic schedulers, service schedulers in, in your uh, cluster you can, you can share with, it actually becomes pretty convenient because, uh, so for example in our case we have Aurora there so we can actually uh, launch uh, Cotton Scheduler as a uh, Aurora task so that that Cotton uh, application actually goes in there launched uh, by another service scheduler which is pretty convenient. Um, so I wanted to um, clarify a bit about a couple of terms here. So uh, just when I say uh, Cotton clusters as you can see here, uh, if the, the entire box is the Mesos cluster, consists of all these um, hosts. Um, a cot when, I, when I say cotton cluster, it's basically all of the collection of MySQL clusters managed by this instance of uh, cotton service. So obviously within one Mesos cluster, you can actually launch multiple copies of uh, cotton, uh, cotton uh, schedulers so that you can actually have different uh, cotton clusters. Um, so the way the, the application is structured is pretty stand, uh, straightforward, pretty standard uh, Mesos programming model. You have the scheduler, you have the uh, executor, and because the scheduler has this global view, it can do centralized scheduling and it can act with confidence uh, to, to react to events happening uh, within, within the cluster, either it's from the Mesos uh, master, for example for slave dying, or it's f from the executor for events such as, you know, the, the MySQL D instance might not be healthy at this point. And, and one thing that importantly that they do is that they coordinate the instances. Uh, like I alluded before, um, for example, we have the elector that elects within a MySQL cluster who's going to be the master and who's going to be the slaves. So, and um, the, we, so, 
even we care about the reliability of the Cotton service, we only launch one instance of the scheduler. That's because um, the scheduler's deployment, upgrade, uh, high availability, and service discovery, service discovery are all managed by Aurora, at least at Twitter. So uh, I guess for, for Marathon, you can do the same. Um, so if one instance dies and crashes, we can get them get the instance uh, rescheduled onto another box. Um, and we store the scheduler states in Zookeeper so that the new instance can basically recover that state. Um, and the executor does uh, typically what executors do. It launches, it prepares the environment for the MySQL D, and it launches the instance of MySQL D and monitors it and uh, it interacts with it. Um, I think uh, the, the two things I highlighted here are coordinating instances by the scheduler and interact with these, these instances by the executor. So let me give you this concrete example. Um, so let's say we have this cotton scheduler deployed to the cluster and the user comes over and uh, uh, calls the HTTP API, say that I wanted to create this cluster with this name and these parameters in, which includes like uh, I have this backup which I want your new instances of MySQL D to recover from. So all these parameters are spe specified as HTTP request uh, arguments. Uh, and then the scheduler is gonna match that request with an offer from the missus master. And it's gonna launch tasks and in turn, I guess you guys are pretty familiar with the whole process. Uh, Mesos in turn launches all these tasks onto these boxes. Um, I put a little elephant over there just to, to, to emphasize that um, there's some complexity on the box uh, that you need to take care of. For example, you have to download the software, MySQL, and you have to recover the state from some backups. So all these rely on external services, and you may be already hosting them on HDFS, um, but we just use that as an example because that's how we do it at Twitter. So let's say uh, everything success, success, successfully launched and the executors are gonna return the st uh, status update for the task and then the scheduler is gonna know, oh, so all tasks have been successfully launched. Then what do you do next? So here's uh, what's important. Uh, and that's strictly from the MySQL high availability book. So we read the book and we put them into the framework. So you don't, you don't have to. Uh, so it's, it's gonna need to, for these three instances, A, B, and C, uh, to elect one master out of the three. So uh, what the executor does is it sends framework messages to the executors, which then interacts uh, with the MySQL D instances to ask about the um, GTIDs that have been executed and the executors reply back reliably because of Mesos, all these results, and the scheduler then can compare the, the GTIDs uh, ha which have been executed on each slave and pick a maximum and pick the slave that owns it and then make the slave the master. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and how does it inform these instances that one of them should become the master and, and others should uh, point to that master. It's done through Zookeeper. Um, so the, the scheduler just tells the Zookeeper, okay, so for this particular MySQL cluster, I'm gonna elect A to be the new master. Um, and Zookeeper is gonna propagate this information uh, to these executors. Um, because the executors are watching the Zookeeper path to get notified about this information. Then uh, you may ask, why not send firmic messages directly to inform the executors and, and why do we rely on this, this external service to propagate this information? Uh, uh, the, the answer here is because this particular information is also important for the clients. So for external visibility, we used a Zookeeper. So later on, as you will see, um, as a client, it's gonna then, uh, with some information returned by the API, to re uh, inquire the Zookeeper service about uh, a few things. One, who's gonna be the master, and who are the slaves, and where is the master, where are the slaves? 
these questions are going to be answered by Zookeeper. And, and in, it's important to note here that the response here with the Zookeeper path, it actually happens right after the API call. So it was not uh, actually here, it was a couple of slides before. So, so that uh, for the requests, you get an instantaneous answer. So the, the MySQL cluster is running and everything's good, um, but if something wrong happens, so that's why uh, we have the uh, executor there, because, so for example, A now is kind of unhealthy, it's kind of slow, for some reason, uh, which is unknown, but then uh, the executor, because it's watching the MySQL instance, it's, it's uh, informing the scheduler through Mesos uh, uh, channel that instance A is kind of unhealthy and I have killed it, basically. Um, but what if uh, host, C suddenly, uh, host C suddenly dies, so there's nobody who can inform them on their behalf so that's why uh, where uh, Mesos comes in handy, because Mesos cluster is watching the, 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 all of the hosts it manages. So Mesos master is gonna tell the scheduler that, hey, host C is down, so likely the, the instance C uh, went down with it. So now the, the scheduler knows that within this particular MySQL cluster, there's only one instance left. So obviously it's gonna then uh, elect B so here's the important note here. So here, uh, even though it's obvious we need to uh, elect B, still we run the whole algorithm that I just described um, to compare uh, the GTIDs to pick the most current slave, which actually, um, when the new cluster first launched, that actually wasn't the whole case. We actually had this uh, short circuit uh, logic to basically pick a random one because you're launching identical uh, instances. There's no, no need to wait for all these uh, results and compare them. Uh, but in a normal cycle, when things need to, to be filled over, uh, that's what we do. Um, moreover, now the, the, the size of the cluster comes down to one and, and we need three. So based on your policy or based on how long the timeout is, uh, the scheduler is gonna launch new instances, for example, D and E, to compensate for uh, A, and, uh, A and C, who just died. So that's the example, and, and that's all good. You, you, you can see that um, uh, Cotton manages and coordinates um, MySQL instances, MySQL clusters, uh, within uh, the Cotton cluster it manages. Then how does the client know about everything? Uh, it's done through service discovery. Uh, so typically, uh, if you have used uh, MySQL in a conventional way, you, you are given this IP or host name, and you're given this port, and you have your user and your password, that's all good. Um, so with Cotton, what you're gonna get back is actually just a, um, because you, sur you, you supply the cluster name, which needs to be unique, and that's your identifier, your C name, if you will, and you supply the rest of these credential related things, um, what the API is gonna return to you immediately is actually just the Zookeeper path, which you can then use to get information, to get service, uh, service discovery results back. And what Cotton is gonna put on to Zookeeper is uh, the IP port where you use, uh, what you use to find these instances, and, and they are uh, what the roles each instance have, so you can uh, pretty clearly know uh, w what the master is and what the slaves are. Um, so the fact that you're using Zookeeper, I think is, is kind of daunting to, to a lot of people, but I have to tell you that at least within Twitter, uh, it's actually uh, pretty common and, and we have, at least Twitter has, and I, I believe um, many uh, open source projects have provided uh, these libraries for you to parse, uh, to interact with Zookeeper, so it's actually not as hard uh, as it sounds. And, and Cotton uses this uh, server sets uh, scheme or protocol to put uh, JSON formatted uh, data into Zookeeper, Z nodes. So 
with some libraries' help, you can actually pretty easily uh, resolve this information from Zookeeper. But if that proves to be a challenging task, there are all these other mechanisms that's uh, um, uh, provided by uh, very various um, Mesos-related uh, projects. So for example, uh, you can use HAProxy, uh, I believe this is uh, what Marathon uh, provides, and you can, you can leverage the DNS protocol, and, and there's uh, Mesos DNS. So all these different things you can use to, to, to watch and to resolve that information. And, and well, quite simply, um, the scheduler itself can query that information for you and expose it uh, with a, a REST API call. So all these are uh, common ways that you can, you can deal with Zookeeper. Um, and I think it will be interesting for, for us to, to put these common things into a Mesos Commons library, which, act which actually is already alive on, on our uh, GitHub Mesos repo. Um, I believe that uh, the plan is to, to put more and more common stuff into the common repository. So um, they've been launched, and if all goes well, then, then you can happily use it. But uh, for any serious use, of course, you're, you're worried about um, different uh, uh, events going to happen in your cluster. So that's where monitoring uh, becomes very important. So uh, actually one thing that's pretty uh, straightforward to think about is actually uh, something re related to monitoring because it's creating a MySQL uh, cluster is actually a pretty long process and, and heavy lifting process because typically if you're running large data sets, it's actually, it takes a long time for it to recover from the backup. So if you're requesting this thing, typically if you're doing this manually, your DBA is gonna tell you, I'm gonna call you back or send you an email back when it's done. Uh, there's no SLAs, because uh, who knows how large the backup is. Um, so if you're doing this through HTTP API, uh, what you're gonna get is some handle that you're gonna use to get informed uh, uh, when, when it becomes ready, which be, can be like an hour long process if your, if your data set is, uh, is large. So that's uh, where the importance uh, of Zookeeper uh, re really, really uh, becomes obvious here. Uh, obvious here. Uh, you can just uh, set up a watch um, on the uh, Zookeeper path and then get notified. So your application can then get notified when it becomes ready. And there are other uh, stats that I can get from um, either Mesos or Cotton. So the, Mes uh, the Cotton uh, scheduler itself exports uh, a set of uh, metrics at the uh, slash vars JSON URL. And uh, Mesos itself exports quite a lot of uh, stats. So for example, if you go to a slave, you go to slash monitor slash statistics.json, you can get these um, memory usage, CPU usage, all these pretty standard uh, s container stats uh, directly from Mesos. And then in the future, uh, of course, we can add MySQL specific stats uh, uh, and have them exported by the executor itself. So um, I think it's pretty important for, for uh, us to provide a way uh, for your um, observability uh, stack to to, to, to scrape these, these uh, uh, metrics. So um, that's all good, but as, a, as an organization, how are you gonna be able to actually use it? Because like I said, MySQL is a pretty heavy and complex piece of software. Uh, I believe there must be some customization that's required for your organization in order to adopt uh, this thing. So. Um, I can imagine there are like a couple of levels of customization. So at a organization level, for example, for Twitter, um, we, we actually use our own release or distribution to MySQL, and it comes with its own setup, scripts, configs, and all that stuff. And, and obviously we need our own place to host the packages, 
And we, as an organization, we have our own ways to make backups and store the backups and make them discoverable. So I think these things are probably very custom to your organization. And, and the way we provide it for you to customize is for this interface. You, you, can, you can implement these interfaces and, and get, get the customization from there. And on a cotton cluster level, so for example, you have your production cotton clusters, you have your development production clusters, they may use different packages, they may use different HDFS, and all that can be specified via uh, the scheduler flags. And of course, for each individual user, for each individual MySQL clusters, uh, the user is gonna have the way to uh, further customize through uh, uh, um, HTTP API rec uh, request. I will, I will give you guys uh, specific uh, examples for that. For example, uh, backups. Um, I don't know how you do it, but we store uh, backups on HDFS, and we store them by certain uh, HDFS path structure. And so basically it comes down to, you have to find it first. After you found it, you need to fetch it, you need to decrypt it, you have to decompress it, and all these things are possible, but probably optional uh, for your case. And then, for example, you can then implement a Twitter backup store and do the fetch. And, and the executor is just gonna call out uh, to, to the backup store to get that step done. Um, and then the flags exposed allows you to uh, do per cotton cluster level customization. For example, you have this uh, backup store arcs, which you can use to specify the HDFS arguments or your HDFS uh, path prefix and all that stuff that's common to this cotton cluster for this collection of MySQL cluster. You can put them in a, in a uh, backup store args uh, sch scheduler uh, flag. And then for each individual MySQL cluster, you can specify um, what particular backup ID I need to use to find my exact backup. The story is the same for installer. Like I said, we use our own MySQL release and we have our some utilities that come with it. So it's basically a cotton installer which may or may not just be fetching uh, the MySQL package. But you can, you, you can, you can see the idea here. Um, it allows you to customize the process. Um, and when it comes to configuration, for example, the MyCom file, it's the same thing. Um, so after you've done all these customization, um, how do you put it into your cluster? Um, so you can do it this way. The Apache Cotton project is gonna it's export its release and put it up onto uh, PyPy, which you can add as a dependency for your customization. And then that becomes your uh, version of Cotton. And because it's a Python um, application, uh, here, at least at Twitter, we use this PAX or Python executable um, mechanism for us to package all these dependencies bundled into one binary so that then the result is a cotton executor packs and a cotton scheduler packs, which we then just drop into the cluster by standard means, and then we can uh, start leveraging cotton as a service. Um, continue on, uh, there's a lot of, so, so Cotton is a, is a new project. Um, it's got this vision of, like I said, we're gonna read the thick uh, MySQL high availability book and put them into the software and it's gonna automate itself so you don't have to worry about, but that's a, a pretty grand vision that needs a lot of work. Um, 
One thing I haven't talked about is uh, obviously as a stateful resource at the storage uh, application, we need to retain the MySQL disk state. And if you went to the, uh, the talk by G and Michael, you probably already have gotten some ideas on how this works. Um, so MySQL is actually gonna be using uh, this new primitives from ASOS to achieve this. Simply put, you just need to do these a couple of things. Um, MySQL is gonna require a couple of data folders to be specified, and then Cotton is gonna create persistent volumes for these folders, and when Cotton leverages these volumes to put their files, um, my, uh, the executor is gonna um, store files there, and the scheduler, when it sees crashes within the cluster, it's gonna, it's gonna try to reuse these volumes, persistent volumes, to schedule the crashed task back onto the boxes where they died and to pick up the existing state. Um, like, I had, like I said, there's a long roll ahead of us. There are a lot of things that needs to be added. And we've chosen the path to implement another framework to leverage the flexibility it gives us. Um, but then we still need to implement these common things. Um, authorization, authentication, and disk IO, that's, that's actually on the Mesos side. A lot of things that's also need to be put together for, for this to, to uh, entirely work, at least for uh, the production level services. And, and you may want to have um, uh, scheduler constraints that, that allows you to put different instances onto different racks and all, all that things. Um, we, we need uh, more effort to be put in it, and we hope uh, to draw a collaboration um, from the community. So if you're interested, these are the resources you can go uh, find uh, this information. Uh, we have our code in um, Apache infrastructure, and they are mirrored onto GitHub, which you can find over there. And we use the standard uh, Apache um, project support infrastructure, such as the JIRA, uh, the RSC, the Twitter handle, and the mailing list for us to communicate. So that's um, all I have, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, I heard that the setup, one master and a couple of uh, uh, slaves. You were asking about. Um, it's uh, not currently, but but I, I can could just because uh, for our uh, first use cases at Twitter, it's it's not the, the setup uh, that we want. But then I, I don't see um, the hurdles of of having that kind of set setup. Um, so the question was, um, do, do, do we have plans to implement other um, services other than HDFS to, to store backups, to store um, package, for example? Um, I, I, I don't think, so, so actually, um, I think, at least from the Twitter's case, the fact that we're using HDFS is actually not a, a technical um, obstacle at all. It's just a couple of HDFS commands that we use, we use, we, we call from 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 the uh, from the Python module, just pretty easily to get things done, uh, to to get things downloaded. So um, the way we we're Im uh, imagining it is just uh, we leave these things out as uh, interfaces, and and of course um, other. Uh, backends 
if there's a generic enough implementation that can cover most of the uh, cases for that particular storage backend, uh, they can be contributed back. Uh, but I think because um, the fact it is fetched from HDFS, just probably one tenth of the logic that actually handles the, the, the backup uh, restore, and, and more thoughts and effort were probably put into um, if your organization uh, encrypts it, compresses it, and all that sort of thing, and, and do post processing and all that. So, and I, I just I imagine that's something that's very specific to your own uh, scenario. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, thanks for coming to the talk, and I hope you're interested, and hope you're gonna join us in this in this effort, and I hope uh, we're gonna make. Uh, MySQL, a much easier thing to use for a lot of common users. Thank you very much.